Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be building a little receiver to tune in WWV. I'll cover the basics of direct conversion receivers, describe in detail the receiver design that I put together, and demonstrate it working along with a frank discussion of its shortcomings. Virtually every ham radio operator or shortwave radio listener in North America has tuned in WWV at one time or another, if only just out of curiosity. But in case you've never heard of it, I'll give a brief summary of what it is. It's a service run by the U.S. federal government to provide a highly accurate time and frequency standard that's easily accessible for commercial use in the general public. WWV broadcasts from Fort Collins, Colorado on six different radio frequencies, and you can easily hear the signal with any radio that can tune to one of those frequencies. In its most basic application, you can listen to the audio tones and set the time on your clocks in your house. In fact, I can remember my dad doing that when I was a kid periodically just to keep us all, I guess, on correct time. Now, for sure, that can't be the only purpose of something this expensive that the government's running. In fact, it's really the frequency standard and timing standards for more advanced test equipment is where this uh, service comes into play. The simplest technique you can use to exploit this technology is something called zero beating. You can use that to adjust the internal oscillator and frequency counters, oscillators, and other devices that rely on having an accurate internal frequency. And in still more applications, there's digital information embedded in the broadcast signal that can be decoded by certain receivers to automatically adjust their own system time. Like I said, there's, this is just a short summary and there's plenty of information available on this service online in case you're really interested. In my case, what I put together here is a design for a very simple fixed frequency receiver to decode just the audio portion of the WWV signal. I mentioned earlier that WWV transmits on six different frequencies, and in theory I could choose any one of those for this receiver. Unfortunately, not all frequencies are easy to receive all day long due to daily changes in the ionosphere. So no matter which one I pick, there will be periods during the day when they're likely to be too weak for the simple receiver to pick up. But nevertheless, I've got to pick one, and based on several trials I've done with my other amateur radio receivers, I decided that 5 MHz was the most consistently available frequency for my location, so that's what I chose. The scheme that I've outlined here is called direct conversion. It's one of several architectures used for radio frequency receivers. Superheterodyne, regenerative, and most recently direct RF sampling being the other three most common approaches. Direct conversion has been around for many decades, but had largely been replaced by superheterodyne, especially in commercial receivers. However, it has seen a bit of renewed usage in some software-defined radio designs. So here's the signal path block diagram, following the usual convention for radios, meaning that I'm showing an antenna on the left, leading to a speaker on the right. The way it works in very simple terms is, you isolate the frequency of interest, in this case the 5 MHz amplitude modulated WWV signal, and mix it with a second fixed amplitude signal at the identical frequency. When you do that, if you recall your mixer knowledge, you'll end up with the sum and difference of the two frequencies, along with some other products that I'll ignore for the moment, again keeping it simple. Because the WWV signal is amplitude modulated, and the second signal is fixed amplitude, what you'll end up with as a result is the baseband audio. Of course it's a bit more complicated than that, but I'll leave the detailed dive for another time. The other elements I show on the block diagram are an attenuator, which is really just a potentiometer. It's used to adjust the strength of the signal fed to the rest of the chain, and also notice there's no separate volume control at the audio amplifier. Its gain is fixed. And lastly, two filters. A bandpass filter ahead of the mixer to reject all radio frequency signals except the one of interest, and a low pass filter after the mixer to select just audio frequency energy to feed into the audio amplifier. 
Now I do need to mention that this direct conversion technique that I'm using here is definitely compromised. The much more common way to decode an AM signal would be to use at least one stage of superheterodyne. And typically you'd have an intermediate frequency, 40, 455 kilohertz is, is very typical. And then apply a product detector or an envelope detector to extract the uh, audio and then process and amplify that. That's a much more robust way to make an AM receiver. Where this approach is compromised is really in two areas. The first is the oscillator signal is never going to be completely in phase with the uh, phase of the carrier coming in. And you'd use, say, a phase lock loop circuit to do that. The lack of phase um, uh, coordination between the two signals is going to cause some degradation in the audio. And for sure, if we were trying to do some sort of digital signal decoding, this would never work at all. And the second is we're assuming that the local oscillator frequency is identical to the received frequency, and it's not. Any error between those two is going to cause some beat signal products and cause distortion in the audio. So those two things are going to make this not sound very well. But nevertheless, um, it's going to work. And I have my own reasons why I chose to, to build the circuit this way, and I'll go through those after I go through the schematic. Okay, here's the schematic. It closely follows the neophyte design from QST Magazine, but I've made several changes to suit my needs. First of all, and this is common with the neophyte design, notice that there's no digital frequency synthesis, no microcontroller, nor any software or computer digital signal processing needed. It's all analog. There's just two integrated circuits and their eight pin devices. The first is the NE602, which is where the direct conversion operation happens, and the second IC is an LM386 audio amplifier. The NE602 is a beautiful little device. It contains the guts of an oscillator and a Gilbert cell mixer. The LM386 is a robust low power audio amplifier. Using these chips saves a bunch of discrete transistors and passives. Now, both of these ICs have been available for decades, and there are dozens and dozens of receiver designs that utilize them, so what I'm doing here is nothing new. I'm not going into the detailed design and operation of either of these ICs. There's plenty of info available online for both of them. Other than that, I'll say there's several newer derivatives available now, in particular the NE612 and the even newer SA612 made by NXP that offer some performance enhancements. So just for shorthand, I'll keep referring to them as the NE602 and LM386. Anyway, back to the schematic. The signal flow path is from left to right. The attenuator isn't shown here because this is the schematic for a PCB I'll build, and the attenuator, like I said, is just a pot, and it's located off the board. So the circuit begins with a basic LC bandpass filter that rejects most of the RF signals that are higher or lower than 5 MHz. The specific component I'm using here is an IF transformer made by Zycon, and it has good properties. Namely, it's easy to retune it for the 5 MHz frequency I need by just adding some additional parallel capacitors to it. I'll set it for maximum through signal strength by a one-time adjustment of its center ferrite slug. The output of this filter is applied to the signal input terminals of the NE602. Now, because this circuit is direct conversion, I need a 5 MHz local oscillator signal. I could build an LO with several discrete components and a JFET and inject the signal into the 602, but it already contains most of the bits and pieces needed for an oscillator, and the simplest designs like mine just add only what's necessary. In my case, I only need one local oscillator frequency, so I could do it with just a fixed LC circuit, but the most stable frequency will be generated using a crystal, and that's what I'm doing here. Two fixed capacitors and one trimmer capacitor for fine-tuning the frequency are all that's needed with the crystal. This design can be modified to receive other WWV frequencies by changing the crystal and changing C5 and C6, and also changing the input-tuned circuit inductance and capacitances. Just like any double-balance mixer, the output of the 602 will primarily contain the sum and difference of the two input signals. So in this case, we'll have the resulting audio coming out, and the 5 MHz local oscillator and the carrier frequency components will largely be absent. Cap C8 and C1 and resistor R3 make a simple low-pass filter to reduce any higher frequency components that might still be present on the output, and keeps those from being fed into the audio amplifier. Capacitor C9 and C10 block any DC offset component on the 602 output. Okay, now looking at the second IC here, it's the LM386 audio amplifier. Now this chip has been around basically since the dawn of time, and there are tons of circuits that use it, even beyond just receivers like this. 
What I'm doing here follows very closely to the application guidelines from the datasheet. The key elements are C12 sets a fixed gain of 46 dB, and the C14 and R6 series network is commonly called a Zobel network and is there to prevent high frequency oscillations. The last item I would comment on here is the power supply. This little radio will run off of a 9 volt battery. The 386 will work off that battery voltage directly, but the 602 has an absolute maximum input of 8 volts. So I've put a very simple 6.8 volt Zener shunt regulator here to knock it down. The 602 only draws about 4 milliamps, so a small SMT 300 milliwatt Zener diode is fine. Here's the layout I created for the PCB. It's 33 by 48 and a half millimeters and is as tightly packed as I think I can still comfortably hand solder. So some key features here. It's double sided, the back side being a nearly continuous ground plane and the top side contains all power and signal traces. I've used SMT components wherever possible. Even the two ICs are available as SOIC 8s instead of DIPs, so that's what I used. And because I'm making this board by hand, I can't make plated through-hole vias, so what I do instead is the most common solution, meaning where I want a via, I place pads on the top and bottom copper layers, then drill the through-hole between them, and then solder in a jumper wire to connect them, and then finally flush cut the wire. But do note that for the ground plane connection side, they all use thermal brake pads. That's important, otherwise you'd be hand soldering to the whole ground plane, and that's harder to do. Before I get into the build and test phase of this project, there's one big question that I think I should answer here, and that is, you know, why build this thing at all? I mean, do I really need a portable receiver that can tell me the time? Um, there's plenty of ways, obviously, to get accurate time throughout the, the day, and I'm not planning on putting this receiver in my pocket and taking it everywhere all day long. So really, the time function isn't so much the, the reason. The, the, the reasons for why doing something like this at all come down to, to three things. First, I did want to build a simple all-analog receiver with no digital content. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I got nothing against using Arduino or Raspberry Pi or microcontrollers in general. They definitely have their purposes and, and benefits. But I also feel that in many cases, they're kind of in the golden hammer phase of their product maturity, meaning people are just using them uh, a bit too much. And in some cases, ending up with projects that are just unnecessarily complex and could get by without them. So that's one of the big reasons. The second is I do want to learn more about how Gilbert cell mixers, in particular this NE602 family of chips, works. And they've been around for decades, and there, there's lots of good solid but yet more complex designs out there. And I figure, well, I'll start with something simple like this basic direct conversion approach, learn how that works pretty, pretty well, and then get into the more advanced stuff next. And then last was just direct conversion receivers in general. I, I knew the basics. Um, I have known them for a while for how superheterodyne works, but direct conversion has always been a bit of a, a mystery. So again, starting with something simple and learning how direct conversion uh, receivers work just made sense. So those are my reasons. Okay, enough monologuing. Here's the PC board artwork. Actually, it's extra copies of the artwork that I saved. It's laser printed on glossy paper, and I use the same toner transfer method that I've used before to make the board. Making a double-sided board is a little trickier than single-sided, but I've got the technique fairly well mastered now. As you can see, the board turned out nice, both front and back. But as usual with this toner transfer method, there's some Swiss cheesing effect on the copper, but it's not heavy enough to affect its integrity. You can also see my manually drilled vias aren't perfectly centered, but they're close enough to work fine. And here's the populated board. Usually I'll do a final cleaning with lacquer thinner to remove all the solder flux, but this time I only did a quick clean after soldering the SMT devices, and I didn't go back to do it again after the through hole soldering. Plus, I also did some rework, so that's why it looks a bit crappy. I also forgot to talk about this diode right here. It's a general purpose diode whose sole purpose is for reverse voltage protection. Since I'm powering this board with alligator clip leads, the chances of me making a polarity mistake are pretty high, so it's there to prevent blowing up the ICs and tantalums. Its voltage drop is not significant to the circuit. Okay, I'm down in the lab and I've connected the circuit board assembly up to the rest of the elements needed to try out this radio. I've got a 9 volt battery to power it, of course. Here's the attenuator, the potentiometer that I mentioned that I'll use to adjust the amount of RF coming in. And off screen, I've got these two clip leads attached to my 40 meter dipole outside. 
uh, to try to get the best uh, and strongest signal that I can. And then of course this is the speaker that I'm using. So if you remember from the intro I was showing this guy as just kind of a, a teaser. There's no way that the LM386 on here is going to drive a speaker that big. So I went with something a little more appropriate. And then, lastly, to try and capture the actual audio, um, I have a microphone set up here that I'll go to a separate sound recorder, and I'll just overlay during the video the moments when I'm actually tuning in the signal, so hopefully it, it comes through as strong as possible. Now what I've done off screen before setting this up is I did use my HP signal generator to create a 5 megahertz 100% modulated AM signal to set the rough tuning of the input uh, can here as well as the oscillator. And what I'll do when I connect up the battery here, I'll do the fine tuning of both of those and and see just how much I can optimize the reception of the signal. Okay, I'm going to take the microphone, put it on top of the speaker to try to maximize the amount of recorded audio I can, and here we go. Let's power it up. And there it is. There's WWV. So I'm going to touch up the input inductor here to try to maximize the volume of the signal. I had preset this with my HP signal generator, so I was pretty close. Didn't need much uh, adjustment there. But this guy, this is the oscillator, um, if you remember, that one of the challenges with trying to use this technique to decode AM is getting the oscillator exactly on frequency and, and of course exactly on phase with the incoming signal. And it's never going to be perfect. So really this adjustment is to try to make this signal as audible as possible and as least garbled as possible. So this one definitely is a little touchier, but nonetheless, I'll give it a try. There's, there's not much audio coming through right now because the signal is probably a little, little weak with fading, but I'll be quiet here for a moment so we can listen to it. At the time, 12 hours, 48 minutes. Coordinated universal time. So that's not too bad. It's not terrible, <laughs> but it's not too bad. About as good as I guess we can expect from a direct conversion receiver. Now, of course, I kind of skipped over, uh, glossed over the fact that I'm using an outdoor 40 meter antenna. So having 70 feet of antenna hanging up in the air, about 30 feet, this is really all the best signal I can get from this design. So it's not that great a performance. And for sure, trying to use this as a portable receiver, it'd be difficult to get an antenna, even a loop stick antenna, like a shortwave loop stick antenna connected to it would be a bit of a challenge. So definitely, you know, this isn't terribly impressive, but it's working. We're clearly picking up the audio uh, from the WWV transmission and able to hear it. So at least that is a, a partial success. At the tone, 12 hours, 49 minutes, coordinated universal time. The other thing I would point out here is I do have this attenuator just about maxed out. And that, that is maxed out. So we're putting the maximum amount of RF into this input filter network. So there is no RF preamp here. So there's only whatever's coming in as a signal going right into that mixer. So it's another area where the design is, is weak. And don't have much signal to play with. In fact, what I did with my HP signal generator off screen was uh, when I was rough tuning this, I just played around with the transmission, uh, not the transmission, but the um, magnitude of the signal rather coming out of the, the generator. And I could barely hear the signal all the way down to minus 80 dBm coming into the circuit. So that's really low. That's about 20 microvolts. So that's hardly impressive for receiver performance. So again, kind of consistent, I guess, with expectations and there isn't much more to be done with a circuit like this. 
The final performance item I want to show here real quick is just how much current I'm drawing from that 9 volt battery. And it will vary depending upon the signal strength and the amount of spoken audio coming through. But nonetheless, let's try to get a quick benchmark here of how much current. So it is fairly efficient in terms of current draw, around 20 milliamps or less. And that isn't optimal if you're going to listen to this transmission for any length of time. Like a particular you know, AM or FM radio, you'd be listening to it for quite a while. This type of signal, if you're really listening in on this little radio, you're not going to be having it on for very long. So 20 milliamps or less is, I guess, an acceptable amount of current. So that's a wrap for this project. I achieved my primary goal of getting a simple direct conversion receiver to work, even if the performance is pretty uh, mediocre at best. But nevertheless, it did work. I was able to hear the audio signal and prove that just the basics of using uh, direct conversion to decode an AM modulated signal. Now, you notice on the board, I did have provisions for mounting holes. And going into this project, I thought I might make a, you know, a simple 3D printed case that I designed for, but I don't think that's worth my time and effort at this point. So, so what to do next? So if I really wanted to explore a simple receiver for WWV, the next natural choice would be to use a single conversion superhead. And I put together this simple block diagram that I'll show you what that might look like. Now, one of the first choices you'd have to make when you're looking at a superhead design is a choice of IF frequency. And since 455 kilohertz is so common and so many circuit designs and components are available that support it, that's a natural choice. So then the next choice would then be to choose a local oscillator frequency, and that's where a small problem comes up. If I want to stick with the 5 megahertz WWV frequency, then I'll need either a 4.545 megahertz or a 5.455 megahertz crystal, and neither of those are readily available. However, if I change to the 10 MHz WWV frequency, then I can use a 9.545 MHz local oscillator, and those frequency crystals are readily available. The rest of the block diagram, meaning the bandpass filter, the IF amp, and the envelope detector, are pretty straightforward to build from existing designs. Another path might be to incorporate other single-chip radio solutions like the ZN414, MK484, or the TA7642, but all of those are obsolete and they're hard to come by, so those choices aren't that great either. In any case, I've got other projects in my queue for my channel that I'd like to do next, but I'll keep thinking about this WWV receiver. Maybe I'll have a version 2.0 in the future that does do a single uh, super hat and see how that performs. So until next time, bye for now.